Please open your Bibles to the New Testament and particularly the book of Luke in chapter 15. Our Lord did much while he was in his earthly ministry to get the Jews to open their eyes to their given position that Christ, or that the Bible, sets out to us that they were to occupy preceding the coming of the Messiah. Of course, they did not understand that. They had a warped view of the reason of their existence. And they had a messed up view, to put it nicely, of the Messiah and his kingdom and the law of Moses. They held themselves aloof from anybody that wasn't one of them and also from many of those they didn't think among their own were doing what was right. The very arrogant attitude that they had. And our Lord in this chapter works with them because if you'll notice, we set the context of this study in the first two verses. Actually, verse 2 of chapter 15. Speaking of Jesus, it says in verse 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now let's stop just for a moment and talk about the word publican. It meant one who actually gathered up taxes for Rome, and it was their custom to take the taxes, then add on to it, and keep the extra for themselves. So no wonder people didn't like them. And sinners, that could cover about anybody, but this could cover Jews as well as others. Well, notice, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Well, our Lord chose that, as he did many times, as a great opportunity to teach about the love of God for all men. And it would help lay some foundation work for the attitude that had to exist in the Jews after they became Christians, following the establishment of the church, of course, as to receiving the Gentiles into the church as brethren in the Lord upon their obedience to the gospel. So he is working with them. Now, there's some things that come out of this, and toward the end of this, I'm going to aim at a little something else, but I want to get the main lesson the Lord had. It takes all three of the particular parables he's going to tell to make the point, because remember, verse 2 tells you who's he, who's he, who he is aiming at, and that's an important point to keep in mind. So he first of all points out that a fellow that has a hundred sheep if he loses one, he leaves the ninety and nine and goes after that one which is lost. And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders and he comes rejoicing and he wants everybody with him to rejoice because he found that sheep. Well, of course, a sheep can know it's lost, but it doesn't know how to get back home. But it can be sharply and keenly aware of the fact it is lost. But keep that in mind. He turns from that to verse 8 where you have a woman who has ten pieces of silver and she loses a piece of it and she really gives the house a going over. The best light she had was a candle, so she lights that so she can see in the corners and she goes throughout the house until she finds it. And then she calls all of her friends, verse 9, her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the piece which I'd lost. In both of these cases, he does what is said in verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Thus, he's emphasizing a sinner that repenteth and the joy that ought to exist, for it exists in heaven, it should exist among God's people on earth when one does that. I want to emphasize something here parenthetically. I've heard all my life, brethren, uh, when someone would respond to the gospel, especially an erring child of God, come repenting, confessing sins, and asking for the prayers of the church. Or when someone is baptized into Christ, they'll talk about how the angels are rejoicing in heaven. Brethren, these passages don't teach that. Look at what the verse says. Likewise, I say unto you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that rebelled. Now, let me ask you a question. Who do you think would be present with the angels that would really be doing the rejoicing? Well, it's God. It's God that's rejoicing. In fact, all that we can get 
about angels. And it's said elsewhere, they don't understand the very idea of being a sinner and being redeemed. They don't have anything like that for them. But God knows, and God rejoices. That's the idea, and you'll see it brought out more in the next one, which we're very aware of, the prodigal son. Now notice, the silver is an inanimate object. It can't know whether it's lost. It doesn't know anything about being lost. It doesn't know anything. But it is lost, and somebody knows it's lost, and somebody knows it has value. Now, there are the first two classes that all sinners in this world fall into. People that are lost, don't know a thing we'll do about it, but they know they're lost. And then I'm afraid a great many more like the silver. They don't know they're lost. They don't know they need salvation. They don't even know the worth of their own soul. But somebody does. And the one that does, does all that he or she can to find that one due to the worth of it. But now remember... The context for these three parables is set in verse 2. Because the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So you can see that the emphasis is given here as he's given these first two parables on people being lost. One knows it's lost but doesn't know the way back home. The other, an animal object, doesn't know it's lost, doesn't know anything about its worth. But somebody does and somebody seeks it as we should. Now, all of this is going to apply to him as to why he's doing what he's doing and thus answer the murmuring of the Pharisees and the scribes. But now we come down to the more lengthy one. And as he brings this down, you've got to think about the Jews and their attitude toward the Gentiles, the murmuring that was done. Think about what he's done already and these other two. And now he says, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. He divided unto them his living. Under the law, uh, you know the firstborn got the most. It comes out to about two-thirds of whatever belonged to the father. And the younger son, or the next son, uh, if ever two as it is here, got about a third of what the father had. Well, he divides it unto them. Notice that. He doesn't say he divides it unto the younger son that demanded. He says he divided it unto them. So the younger son takes it, and this is why we call him the prodigal son. The word prodigal means wasteful. He's the wasteful son. So not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, the, uh, there, when he spent all there arose a mighty famine in the land, he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the, his fields to feed swine. Well, to a Jew, that's about as low as low could ever be low. Because they were forbidden to have anything to do with pork as far as eating it. So he's that bad off. He's willing, he's hit, he's hit the bottom of the rut below the snake's belly. <laughs> he's down there. Now notice how bad off he is. He would have eaten the husk that the pigs were eating. And no man gave to him. And when he came to himself, that's an important point. People sometimes have to hit, as the old saying goes, rock bottom before they open their eyes to see things for what they really are. We oftentimes hope and pray daily that people we know in particular, and some even our own family, will have to hit that rock bottom so that they'll open their eyes to their true condition, realize who's responsible for it, and then do what they need to do personally to change their whole situation. But sometimes we don't know what all a person may have to go through if they do have the wherewithal to change before they will do that. You'd like to get your loved ones through as easy as possible. Sometimes that's not the case. And in this case, He's gone to the bottom. But he does come to himself. That's more than what can be said of some people. He comes to himself. And he thinks clearly. He evaluates things objectively. He remembers what he had at home and the training and teaching and care he received there. And he asks himself, notice the reasoning he's doing. He hasn't lost his ability to reason. And he's willing to reason with the evidence right before him in his condition and what he's left. 
How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Uh, by the way, there's another good example that we've commented on several times over the past weeks. When a person comes to himself and realizes that I have sinned, I have transgressed God's law. And notice what the rest of, the, of it teaches about him. He chose to do that. He enjoyed what he had while he had it and just spent it right and left till it was gone. He learned pretty quickly nobody cared for him, nobody gave for him because he had only fair weather friends. Well, and uh, he says, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I'll just be glad to be a servant because they're far better off than I am. Now, that's humility, folks. That is hitting rock bottom and doing the right thing with the rock when you hit it. That's exactly what it is. Well, notice, he knows he has to do something. He can't just sit and think about it and come to the right conclusions and know what needs to be done. It says, and he arose and came to his father. Now, you know, that's, that could be embarrassing. That could be very embarrassing. And yet, he had reached the stage to where he could come before his own father and say, I have made a mess of it. And I don't want him to be considered a son any longer. I just want to be a servant. But I notice, let's stop here for a minute and go back to the father. Nothing in this indicates the father didn't do his duty fully and completely as a father would to his son. The son, by the way, does not ask for anything that wasn't his. And the father divides up what he has with the two sons. Obviously, the older son chose to stay there because he's still there when the younger one gets back. But the father is waiting, ever waiting, ever looking, because notice... He arose and came to his father. But now watch this. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. What does that tell about the love of the father for his son? All this time he was somewhere, wasted his substance in riotous living, had nothing, was starving to death off in a hog pen, everything he shouldn't have been and taught not to be. But there he was. But the father is ever looking. Do you think the father, as a human being, was praying about it? Do you think the father knew at this point he had done all he could do? Now remember that. The father had done what he should have done. There's no indication in the Bible, as Jesus gives this, that the father had not performed his duty and meant all that he should have been in every way. So he's so much looking for him that when he gets in eyesight, a great way off, he sees him. And he has compassion on him. He doesn't just walk out there and stand at the end of the driveway and wait for him to get there. He runs. And notice that he falls on his neck and he kisses him. Now let me ask you something. What does that say about God's desire for the salvation of souls of all men, no matter what state they are in? You talk about unconditional love. You talk about agape love that always seeks another's highest good. The earnestness of God. Now, don't forget what provoked all of this. The Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eateth with them. Now, what has Jesus taught so far? Well, you need to know, those of you who prize yourself to be great in your knowledge of the law and the best there is on earth that God has, God ought to be happy to have you. There are people in this world who are separated from God, thus lost in their sins, and they know they're lost. They know that whatever philosophy is guiding their life is not satisfactory, but they don't know a thing in the world to do about it. Then there are those that don't even know the value of their soul. They don't know what it means to sin. They don't know what lost is. They're not interested one way or the other because they don't know to be interested. But there are those that are interested who knows their worth more than they know their worth, and they go out there and seek to find them because it's important. But then you've got the boy. The boy could know he was lost and did. And he could know and did know the way back home, and he took it. Now, that's the third class of lost people in this world. There are those in sin, those who are lost, and they know they're lost when they finally come to themselves and they know the way back home. 
And so he comes home. But what does he find? He finds again rejoicing. The father's been looking for him. No way you can read this and say the father wasn't always looking just to see. Maybe he's coming in. Maybe that's him. Maybe that's him. Did you hear something? Was that him? You can see it taught by the words of Jesus. And so he sees him. He has compassion. What is compassion? Well, it's filled with mercy and favor, understanding that some people think they're making the right choices and make a big mess out of it when it happens. And you're wanting to forgive them. You're wanting to display mercy to them. You want them to know that you love them and you understand. But it's up to them. They've got to be the one to come to themselves. They must be the one to make the choice. They must do what's necessary to make the journey back home. But when they do that, the Lord is not going to slam the door in their face. Now, these Jews need to understand that particular matter. But we really haven't got to the main thing yet. Because the Father, you know, throws a big coming home party, as they would in those days. Because he confesses, just like he said that he would, Father, I've sinned against heaven in thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. But the Father said to his servants, talk about full forgiveness, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Well, remember earlier there was rejoicing when they found the silver, when they found the lost sheep, and there was even rejoicing in heaven in the presence of the angels. And now you have this elaborated on more here. For this my son was dead. Now mark that. What was in the mind of the father regarding the state of the son when he was out there in the hog pen and when he was before that engaged in his riotous living and wasteful of the inheritance? He said he was dead. What does that tell you about the attitude of the father and the state of mind toward that son? Well, dead means separated. He was separated from him. Uh, while he was out there living contrary to the father's will and being so proud of himself, he was dead. And the father recognized him. This, my son was dead. But notice, the action of the son indicating repentance and confession of sin and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now we're going to see where the Lord brought this thing and to who, whom he really had in mind on this. Now the elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and said, uh, What do these things mean? What's going on? And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatty calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came the father out and entreated him. Now think about that for a minute. And think about what Jesus was doing with the Jews in his earthly ministry that provoked even these parables. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandments, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatty calf. Now, what were the Pharisees and the others doing when Jesus met with the publicans and sinners? They were complaining because this man claims to be who he is, and yet he's over here with these folks. Well, the point simply is this. How can you help people if you're not in a position to help them? And that's the whole thing that the Jews didn't get. And the elder brother is really where all this is headed for because he's like those Pharisees. And scribes that were murmuring because the Lord was associating with publicans and sinners. This is who it's told about. But look at all the things the Lord gives us that we can use in so many other ways and use them rightly. But I want you to see the real context. And it was then that the Jews are the elder brothers. The Jews who murmured or represent or the elder brother represents them. And notice how he answers the elder brother. This is the father speaking. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet or suitable that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now that's where the Jews were lacking. They were lacking in understanding who they were. 
They were lacking in understanding that even the Old Testament taught that God loved everybody. If they had understood the message of the book of Jonah, they wouldn't have had this problem if they had accepted it. Because Jonah had this problem. He did not want to go preach the gospel as it was in that day and time to those people because he tells us why, if you read it, if I preach to them and they listen and they understand and they repent, God's going to forgive them. Now, I can't stand that. <laughs> That's why he ran off and did what he did. And so at the end of the book, you find out then that God makes it so clear how important and how much worth there were to those people in the city. And that's what Jesus is doing right here. He's doing the same kind of mindset that Jonah had. So he tells them that we ought to be of the state of mind that when a person genuinely repents, when a person uh, confesses sins, when a person demonstrates that they're doing their part as God requires them, then we're ready to forgive them and we'll even run down to meet them when we see them coming. Now, that's the attitude of willingness to forgive anybody. You can't forgive anybody and everybody until they come to themselves, acknowledge what this young man had acknowledged in his own mind, and then acted upon it. But it's quite evident this young man had repented and he was coming back to take the lowest of the low which is far better than what he was. That's humility. And that's exactly what we need to think about. Now, let's make a modern day application. Even though that's exactly the way the Lord made it, it does tell us always the worth of a soul. It tells us the classes of, 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 of sinners that are out there in this world. And we, as we preach the gospel, must realize when we're preaching to the class that we were represented by the sheep, you know, you're lost, but you don't know how to come home. Or the ones that don't know they're lost, don't know what lost is, like the inanimate object of the silver, but they're worth something, worth scouring the house to find. Or the young man who had chosen deliberately to leave the good things, I'd been taught, and go out and live contrary to everything that he had been raised to understand and do that was right. And yet he can come to himself, and he did. And he acted upon the way back home that he well knew. There's not anybody in this world that's lost that does not fall into one of those categories. Not a one. So you know as the church commissioned of God to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, those are the choices that are out there, that is, that you need to know about that people fall into, the categories, I should say, that sinners fall into. But there's something else here that, that doesn't really hit directly at us in the prodigal son. You see, I said earlier, there's nothing said by Jesus that the Father, of course that's representative of the Father in heaven, but that the Father didn't do his part, didn't do all that God expected him in rearing that child. And we would say today, Ephesians 6, 1, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This child still had something more important, he thought, in his mind than the good upbringing, the good teaching, and the good training. And he asked for what was his. I'm sure he had in his mind he was going to go out and live it up. But, you know, it's sort of like socialism. You can do that as long as the other money, the other person's money lasts. And um, you can do it with your own money and as long as it lasts. But it runs out somewhere down the road. And he wasted it. He didn't use any good sense with it at all. He just threw it away and had some fair with the friends that uh, when the money was gone, they not only left him in Vegas, but everything else. And uh, there's a lot of folks out there in Vegas, by the way, that are in that same boat. Or maybe they did get back home, but they left their money in Vegas. And how much that stands for so much that's so wrong in people when they make the wrong decisions. Brethren, listen, you can rear your children and teach them the truth and set a godly example before them and work with them and teach them and help them and they still may be like the product of son. When they do things like that, you can still be like the father, praying about them, and always saying, nevertheless, not my will, but God's be done. And you can be ready if ever you see them at a distance, having come to themselves and on their way back home. That's one of the greatness of things that we need to think about. It's not wishful thinking. It's not saying whether it ever will happen. Everybody doesn't do this. But it had to have happened, the reality here somewhere or the other, or there wouldn't make any sense out of this. 
The ultimate application, the way the Lord did, was you Jews don't be like the elder brother. But our understanding of things, what we want to incorporate in our lives as the church and Christians and concerned for the lost and ready to forgive people who will come to themselves and know the gospel and obey it. And we also can realize this came out of a real life situation or there couldn't have been a parable. And thus there are those that choose to walk away. And sometimes they're young people from a good and wholesome thing. And it's no fault of the parents. I want to tell you what happens every single solitary time that a family member goes wrong. Now I understand parents can be rotten. There's plenty of them out there today that are. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what Satan will do to a good person when they've done everything they could as they also were learning and growing and developing. But the children made a choice. Now notice this child made a choice. He chose to take off and leave home. I'm sure he thought there were greener pastures over there somewhere. What Satan will do to every godly parent who has a not-headed kid like this is make him or her or both parents feel like you loused it. Folks, there's not, there are no parents under the sun, no matter how much Bible they know, how much they live it, that can't grow as parents. That's understandable. So that's true of anything about being a Christian. Mistakes are made. None of us are flawless. But you know, we can live well enough to do our duty in raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but will they do their duty and have enough sense paying attention to it? They may have to go down to the very mud of the hog pen before they come to themselves. My prayer for everybody, whether they're children or not, that leave the faith turn a deaf ear to it, rebel against it, run completely away from it, is that there's somewhere a hog pen waiting for them. If that, in God's good wisdom, is what it will take for them to open their eyes and know what they've departed from. So don't let Satan sell you a bill of goods that says, well, it must be my fault. I'm worthless. Folks, when Satan sells you that and you accept it, you will be worthless. You'll throw in the towel. You'll just give up. What you need to do is simply say, well, where I see that things aren't right in my life, I'll repent of them and do better. What do you think went on in the mind of this father when he didn't know where his son was? That, it, that his son had done all these things. Don't you know he pondered and wondered and looked down that path a long time every day well, if he's like any other loving parent, he would have. But the Lord never said, well, the parent, the fault, the child did what he did. Never did. Never did say that. And if that doesn't prove children can decide to go and do things that they haven't been raised to do, then you tell me what would have to be in this book besides other teaching on the matter that it would. Because you raise a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and you set a godly example for them, doesn't mean that that child's always going to receive it, or if they do, that they will keep it. Children do what they do because everybody's somebody's child. Remember that. Everybody's somebody's child. Stalin was somebody's child. Hitler was somebody's child. Charlie Manson, somebody's child. Now, do you think when they were little babies that they weren't just as cute as these little babies around here? Of course they were. But they grow up. They make choices themselves. And many times they make bad choices. And you wonder why. But they do. The fact is they do. You may never figure out why they do what they do. That they were trained not to do. And forsake the way they were trained to go. Well don't try to ponder it. Because I don't know that the father would ever wonder. Why this child said I've got to have it now. And I want to go. Truth of the matter is, you can't guarantee anybody being what they ought to be, no matter how godly example you are or how well you train them and teach them. But the point is, do your part. And you fulfill your responsibility. And that's what the Bible's saying about the responsibility of parents. 
Do what God requires of you to do as a father and a mother. Be all you ought to be. Train and teach. Set the godly example. Guide them down the right way. Then if they spurn it, it's not your fault. And I close by reminding you of what we've done many times when we've noticed Eli of the Old Testament and Samuel. Both of them had adult children that were as rotten as they could be. God held Eli accountable for his children's actions. He did not hold Samuel accountable for his children's actions. The question is why? Samuel, if you read about him, did what he was supposed to do in restraining or attempting to his children. Eli didn't. So what does that tell me in that written aforetime time for my learning, Romans 15, 4? It tells me you can do all that you need to do and ought to do. And you fulfill your responsibility. That child has responsibility to fulfill too. Now, what's the most obvious in that? God's perfect, flawless. And look what all he's done for mankind. Now, out of all of the huge numbers of mankind, how many will, will love him and heed the gospel call, humble themselves, believe it, and obey it, and participate in all the glories that God has for those who will meekly take the truth and from the heart obey it? Not many. Jesus said, many are called, few are chosen. He said, the way to heaven is straight and narrow. Few there be that find it. And yet it's the way to glory. The hardest thing in this world is to get people to go to a place of eternal life. Think about it. A place where there's no more death, no more dying, no more sin, no more consequences of sin, no more devil. Nothing is there that could cause a person to be hurt in any form or fashion. And he said, here it is. But because it doesn't suit us, we turn it down. So I wanted to give some time to that. I think it's important we think about it for various ways, certainly the way the Lord gave it and for the reason he gave it. But then to realize also this matter about parents and rearing children and how we should view things. If you're not a Christian this afternoon, we hope you'll seriously consider your life and realize the importance of preparing to meet your maker when life's over. To believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. At that point, you become a Christian. The Lord adds you to the church. Then you live your life in service to the Lord, as the New Testament teaches. If you die faithful, heaven's your home. And there's no reason to die any other way. As a child of God, are you faithful? Are you living like the Lord wants you to live? Are you zealous for the cause of Christ? If not, we plead with you to come to yourself and know the way back home in repentance and confession of sins and prayer to God for forgiveness. And once again, walk the straight and, way, the straight and narrow way to heaven. If you're subject then to his good invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.